This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Jax. Jax is the user-friendly wallet that works across all your devices and handles both Bitcoin and Ether. Go to jax.io and embrace the future of cryptocurrency wallets. And by Shapeshift.io, the easiest, fastest, and most secure way to swap your digital assets. Don't run the risk of leaving your funds on a centralized exchange. Visit Shapeshift.io to get started. Hi, welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And my name is Brian Fabian Crane. We're here today with uh, Nick Morgan. Nick is a partner at Paul Hastings, which is a law firm in, in Los Angeles. And he was also before uh, in the enforcement division at the SEC for seven years, you know, pursuing uh, various security cases. And, and of course, the SEC has been a sort of word and topic in the blockchain space for many, many years. People often thought, okay, what's the SEC going to do? What action are they going to take? Recently, they put out uh, the report on the DAO, which is a long report, very interesting report. So I'm super happy that we have Nick on today to, to speak about this report and to speak a bit about, you know, how does the SEC look at these things? What kind of action can we expect from the SEC in the coming years? And how is that going to impact the blockchain industry? So thanks so much for joining us today, Nick. Thank you for having me. Exciting topic. Yeah, absolutely. So can you give us some uh, background? A lot of people will have heard about the SEC, but not really be uh, too familiar with the details. Like what is the SEC and what it, what is its mandate? So the SEC is a U.S. federal agency. It was created in the 1930s as a result of the stock crash in the late 1920s. Um, and Prior to its creation, uh, there was very little federal regulation of the securities markets. And so there were two acts promulgated, the 1933 Securities Act and the 1934 Securities Exchange Act. Uh, and they each did different things. Uh, the 34 Act created the SEC. And the mandate of the SEC is really twofold. Its uh, disclosure of material information is required and uh, it has an anti-fraud uh, backstop for that. So. Uh, the original conception, and it's basically held true, is not to evaluate the merits of a particular investment, but to require disclosure of information and to prevent fraud in those disclosures. And that's carried through from the 1930s to today. That still is the mandate of the SEC. It looks for fraud and requires disclosure. And what is the reach of the, F of the SEC? What is its jurisdiction Well, a threshold issue, which I'm sure we're going to talk about today, is uh, it's limited to uh, securities. And so an obvious first question when the SEC seeks to assert jurisdiction is whether a security is involved. So that's a subject matter limitation. And then it has some geographical limitations as well. It's it's obviously focused primarily on U.S. investors, although not exclusively. And so at the fringes, uh, where you see uh, investors outside the United States involved in business enterprises outside the United States, uh, the SEC's jurisdiction is not as strong as it is when the businesses and investors are in the United States. And, and so you were in enforcement at the SEC. What does, what does that job look like? What was your role there and what would you actually do day to day? So I was in the Los Angeles office and the SEC has offices all around the United States and the enforcement staff attorneys are looking for cases to bring. So they have lots of different ways they get information. And uh, some of those methods have changed as uh, technology and, and statutes have uh, been changed over the years. But essentially we would take in information from informants, uh, disgruntled investors, employees, whatever the source, other regulators um, to see whether there was uh, a securities law violation. And then we would investigate it. Um, this is before there's any lawsuits involved. The staff has the power to send out subpoenas to require production of documents, to require witnesses to come in and give testimony. They gather those facts, they put them together and internally decide what to do. Uh, and that decision is made by five commissioners in Washington who are politically appointed. And they have the uh, decision-making authority about whether the SEC should file a lawsuit and pursue these violations. So the day-to-day -day job of a staff attorney is to collect information, organize the information, and then help make the recommendation about whether to do something about it. Cool. Well, let's let's move to the specific example of the DAO, and then maybe we can come back a little bit to SEC enforcement and, and what this could look like in this industry too. 
So of course the DAO, many people will be familiar with it, but I'll just give a little bit of background for those who aren't. So the DAO was this decentralized autonomous organization, which was uh, proposed at the DEFCON 1 first in London uh, by uh, this German company, Slocket. Uh, Slocket, of course, was trying to do these IoT devices, Ethereum IoT devices. And sort of in essence, they tried to raise money for themselves by creating this VC fund, how they call it, kind of decentralized VC fund. And they raised uh, 12 million Ether, which was at the time about $150 million. Um, and, and their idea was that you would make proposals to this DAO, people could, token holders could vote on it, fund different projects, and then they would hopefully generate a return and give back money to these token holders. And the idea was that the DAO, it's, uh, the slot in itself would make one of those proposals. And then uh, there was, this was quite rushed, it was quick, they raised a ton of money and it was, uh, not so well written code, for example. So there was a podcast which we did about 10 days before it got hacked about all the security flaws and what they were doing. And then right, and actually one of the things we discussed there was what it got exploded. Uh, so this was posted by a Cornell professor, Emin Gunser, and, and then they got hacked and about a third was stolen, which was around $50 million. And then uh, of course there was a big disagreement about what to do. People ended up, uh, the majority ended up deciding, okay, we're going to undo this hack, uh, do a hard fork, take the money back, uh, which is what happened. However, uh, it was a hard fork and some people did not like this. And then they continued on the old chain. And this is also how Ethereum Classic was born, which of course still is around. So it was a big, a huge effect, um, a huge event in the history of Ethereum. And, uh, and now, yeah, now you have this report by the SEC on, on that and what they think about this. So with that background, what do you think about this report? How do you, what's your general impression? I think the report is really unremarkable. I mean, obviously, as you said, uh, everyone was sort of waiting to see what the SEC would, would what the SEC's take on uh, these types of technologies would be. Um, but anyone who's sort of a student of, uh, securities law wouldn't be surprised by anything that was in the Dow report. Um, it appeared to apply longstanding law to a novel new area, which is what the SEC does. So I didn't think it was that remarkable. Um, these 21A reports uh, are not uh, that common. They come out every once in a while on a variety of topics where the SEC wants to make a pronouncement about something. And this looked like you know, a good place as the SEC is fully aware that people want to know. What does the SEC think about uh, these kinds of fundraising technologies? And it, to me, when I read the report, and obviously this was the first time that I've read such a report, it, the tone is is quite accuses um, Slocket and its its uh, co-founders of illegally selling a security, um, or at least it makes that claim. It it, it doesn't place guilt upon them, but you know, it's it's quite clear that in their position there was wrongdoing, from their position, sorry, that there was wrongdoing. Um, what would it take? I mean, what what more do we need in order to have uh, a an enforcement of of basically this report that just lays out, you know, their 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 side of the story and their position? Right, and and that's one thing to keep in mind is when the SEC issues a report like this, you're getting a one-sided view. You're getting the SEC's view. We don't get to hear the other side's view. But to answer your question, this report dealt uh, almost entirely with whether the DAO was a security or involved a security, and and the importance of that issue obviously is if it's not a security, the SEC doesn't have jurisdiction, and the federal securities laws don't apply. So. Uh, so it was important that they sort of stake out their ground and say this is a security. Several things flow from the conclusion that it's a security. The first one being every securities offering or sale has to be either registered or exempt from registration. So when you describe accurately that the report says the Dow uh, principles um, had liability, they had broken the law, what the SEC really focused on was the fact that the Dow had not registered or qualified for an exemption from registration. I think the case that they, that the SEC will bring next against someone uh, will involve the other aspect of the federal securities laws, the anti-fraud provisions. And I think the discussion about whether uh, a security exists and whether registration was required will 
be included in that type of a case. But I don't think we'll see the next case uh, be argued solely on the basis of whether it's a security and whether it should therefore have been registered. There will be an anti-fraud component to that. And why do you think that this report was written uh, about the Dow and not some other um, decentralized autonomous organization, ICO, or, or even Ethereum itself? Well, this is me speculating, but I think the Dow was fairly high profile uh, because of the hack. It got a lot of press. Uh, the amount of money raised was fairly significant. So that's uh, another factor in favor of choosing this one over another one. And I also think that the way the Dow principles marketed or promoted the Dow um, made it a fairly easy case for the SEC. There are certainly more difficult uh, legal uh cases where it would be harder for the SEC to make its point. So here they have a high profile, fairly large dollar amount, and legally a fairly simple, uh, straightforward analysis. So I think that those probably all weighed into their selection of this case to, to use as its vehicle. Cool. Well, let, let's go into a little bit of the details of the argument here. Of course, the, the standard criterion that the SEC uses here is this thing called the Howey test. And many people will have heard about this. So the Howey test, I'll just read kind of the one sentence definition, actually very short and simple. So it's an investment contract uh, or an investment contract is an investment of money into a common enterprise with an expectation of profit to be derived from the entrepreneurial effort of others. So basically four things, right? Investment of money, common enterprise, expectation of profits and entrepreneurial effort of others. And then they just kind of apply that to the DAO. Right. And so the, I, mean, I guess even the first point is kind of interesting, right? So they say investment of money, clearly it was. So they consider Bitcoin, Ether and, and cryptocurrencies here money. Was that surprising to you or? No, that, that seemed like a pretty straightforward application. Not, not too much to talk about there. Actually, what was interesting is that in, in when, they, when they used that in, in the first thing, they said, you know, this was they, they gave it, uh, Bitcoin or they gave Ether and this was an investment of money into a common enterprise. Now, in the second thing, the common enterprise, they don't actually talk about it much. They don't justify why they um, consider this a common enterprise DAO and just sort of gloss it over, which surprised me a little bit. So can you elaborate on that? Is What is a common enterprise? Well, so it's a grouping of people who are going to act with a common purpose as opposed to uh, uh, individuals who are making individual investments that are unrelated to the other investors. So here, the, the all of the investors in the DAO had uh, a common interest in that investment, as opposed to one person making an investment that's unrelated to the other investors. So I didn't I didn't view the the SEC's report as sort of shying away from that issue. It just didn't seem that there was much to talk about there because um, it seemed pretty self evident that this this particular application involved a common enterprise. So that almost sounds like any crowdfunding campaign would be into a common enterprise. Do you, do you I, think that's I, true? I agree. Yeah. If, if people are going to design their, uh, their enterprise so that it doesn't uh, uh, qualify as security, common enterprise is not, is not where you're going to win that battle. So it's, 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 it's sort of inherent in the nature of a crowdfunding uh, um, arrangement. And, and then the next point was this uh, expectation of profit. Of course, this was, as you point out, was easy to argue in the case of the DAO because they said it's a for profit and it's going to pay out basically dividends or rewards, right? So this is uh, straightforward in that case. But it's interesting uh, to think about or, or to, to understand exactly uh, to what extent this depended on what people marketing the DAO said as opposed to, you know, the expectation of people participating in that. How, how does the SEC look at that? So the expectation is the investor's expectation. So if the promoter said, uh, for example, we don't, you should not expect any uh, profits from this enterprise, but the SEC was able to find evidence that the investor still expected profits from the enterprise. That would be an interesting, much closer case, uh, and I wouldn't want to predict which way it would come out, but the investor's expectations are where the focus would be. So if the economic reality is different than the way the promoters characterize the investment, the SEC will look at the economic reality of the transaction rather than the label or the, the gloss that's put on it by the promoters.
Let's take a short break to talk about Jax. Jax is your wallet, your complete user interface to cover all your blockchain needs. I've been using it and I've been loving it. Now, Jax supports a lot of different cryptocurrencies. It supports Bitcoin, Ether, Litecoin, Ethereum Classic, Zcash, Augur Rep, and they're adding many more. Keep responding to users' needs. Now, with Jax, the nice thing is that you can manage all of those coins within a single wallet and you are in control of your own private keys. They're not on their server. And there's a single 12 word seed that you can use to back up your wallet, all your coins and sync them across different devices. Talking about devices, they're on pretty much any device that you can think of. You can get it on PC, Mac, Linux. You can get it on smartphones like Android and Apple and iPhone. You can get it on tablets or even there are even browser extensions for Chrome and Firefox. And on top of that, in JAX, you can actually exchange different cryptocurrencies for each other because they've integrated a shapeshift. And more partnerships and integrations are coming down the line in 2017 that are going to make JAX even better. So JAX is really making blockchain and cryptocurrencies accessible for the masses, easy to use for the masses. Make sure to, sure to get your own JAX wallet at JAX.io or you can get it from any of the app stores you are using. We'd like to thank JAX for their support of Epicenter. How easy is it to prove that investors had an expectation of profit? You know, when you're talking about you know, several thousands of investors, how do they make that? Well, so it's interesting. So this issue has come up most recently. There's a, a I don't know if you're familiar with the EB-5 visa program, where people uh, outside the United States are able to make um, investments in the United States and qualify for a visa if certain conditions are met. So that's created a whole cottage industry where uh, enterprises in the U.S. are selling interests to build a shopping mall or, or do whatever. Um, and in that case, the people making the investments really could care, well, in many instances, could care less whether the shopping mall or the plant or whatever it is that's being built with the investor money, whether there's a profit. They're investing for the purpose of getting a visa. And so they have, whether they have, whether they actually make money on investment or not is irrelevant to them. And so there have been several cases uh, brought where there was an argument that there was no security involved because there was no expectation of profits. And uh, the issue hasn't been litigated to my knowledge in a very sort of satisfactory way where you could pull it apart and see. Um, but the answer to how difficult it is to prove is the SEC would go and talk to investors and find out what their expectations were. That's, that's how they would go about it. That's interesting. And it's interesting also how it, it relates in this case to certain ICOs. Uh, I mean, one could argue that um, uh, ICOs that sell tokens that have a utility value within uh, the application that uh, the developers are creating, that these tokens you know, have some value in that investors may, in fact, uh, not have an expectation of profit, but have an expectation to people use the future app, the, the application in the future. Um, would, would you see that as perhaps a point upon which the, the SEC would have a hard time proving this uh, this point, right, about expectation of profit? It, it is. That would be a good, if, if I were representing someone who had been sued by the SEC for a failure to register or be exempt, uh, I would make that argument. And so what you, it's, it's sort of a dose of reality here, the way this would come about is the SEC would investigate it. They would talk to investors. They would talk to the principals, the creators, um, and they would come to a determination of whether they thought it was a security. And during the investigation, there would be an opportunity to talk with the staff members who were doing the investigation and try to persuade them that this is not a security. Um, on a fairly esoteric point like this, I can tell you the SEC would not uh, necessarily be interested in the finer academic points, um, particularly if there is also a, a potential fraud um, being committed in connection with the offering. So it's a good defensive point to raise. And if you're, if you're trying to organize a uh, uh, an ICO in a way that's not a security, you'd want to obviously make it uh, so that the expectation of profits is diminished. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's diminished. I guess there is also kind of degrees here, right. And, and to different extent. And, and, um, if you have 10,000 investors and for 500, you can kind of demonstrate, okay. They said they clearly did expect that and, and some other part you know, had maybe more mixed motivations. Does it matter? Like, you know, what percentage of investor or? 
Uh, I don't, there's no sort of hard line, uh, bright line of uh, percentage of investors and, and what their expectations are. The, the way these things normally play out is uh, the SEC would gather information about investors who uh, supported their case. They would present those. And if someone were actively defending, uh, they would try to find investors who had uh, a different conception of what the investment was. And, and then you're you know, sort of at the mercy of a federal court judge or, or an administrative law judge to make the decision or potentially a jury. Okay, excellent. And then the final point, which is actually where the SEC spent the most time on, and I think it is also the most tricky one, because, you know, even if you have the, the other one, reasonable expectation of profit, I think people today investing, putting money into um, these crypto crowdfunding campaigns, invest, expectation of profit is certainly a very prominent, or, you know, it, it's certainly what drives this in almost any token sale to a significant extent. So I think that one, again, is going to be less or more tricky depending on project to argue against. But I think there'll always be a plausible case to make that that was the case. So maybe the last one is the most interesting one. So this derived from managerial effort of others. The SEC clearly argues that this was the case here, that the people basically relied on the Slocket team and the founders to to make this profit. Do you feel this was a, a clear cut in in your in, in your view? Do you think one could make a good argument that this wasn't the case here? So yeah, I think I agree with you. This is the, the element of the Howey test that the SEC uh, struggled the most with. And I do think uh, this is the place where a fight could be won. Um, really the, the test of, of um, expectation of profits coming solely from the efforts of others um, if you keep in mind sort of the history of the Howey test, the Howey test came from the 1940s and it involved uh, citrus groves in Florida being sold to investors vacationing from New York. Um, and so there's, you know, decades of experience of courts wrestling with novel um, arrangements and whether they arise solely from the efforts of others. Um, there've been uh, earthworm farms, chinchilla breeding programs. I mean, every possible uh, way to raise and use money has been used. And this element gets a lot of attention. Mm -hmm. um, and so here, yeah, I think they struggled a bit with this one. And uh, uh, ultimately, what they're trying to do is decide whether the investors are really passive investors or whether they're actively involved in creating the value. And they decided here that, that the investors were not actively involved, that they had to rely, as you say, on the curators and the socket uh, principles for the investment to pay off yeah so, so they cite a lot of examples here they so they, they clearly have a case i mean i think one could make the opposite case too and, and you know if you look at this let's say we look at the reasonable expectation of profit right it's pretty clear this was structured in a way to make a profit for people but at the same time if we look at the other one you know derived from managerial effort of others Actually, I think fundamentally the idea of the DAO was that this wasn't the case, right? So you, you can, of course, say in the reality in this beginning, there was many many aspects in which you still relied on the efforts of others and, and the funding team and stuff. But I, the, I mean, the whole idea of it was that it was a decentralized fund, that the decisions would be made in a decentralized way and the, fu the money would be managed in a decentralized way. So it's it's interesting that they you know so focused on that point and they they clearly seem to think they have a a strong argument there that it sort of almost didn't live up to its own promise and that's why it is a security. I agree with your interpretation. I, they I, I would say um, though that I found their argument defensive. I thought they put a lot of effort on this element because it was the closest call, the, the closest to not being met. Um, and so if I were a defense attorney arguing against the SEC on this element, that's where I would focus my energy because I think you're right. This sort of contradict this argument by the SEC contradicts the whole conception of, of, of the decentralized uh, investment like this. So um, it's a place where, uh, it, so again, we're looking at a report that's just the SEC's point of view. If we were in court in front of a judge, we would be making the arguments that you're making to show that, in fact, this is about as... Uh, decentralized as you can get, although I suppose you can structure it differently to be even more decentralized. So what's interesting in this report is that the, so the, the SEC uh, describes the activities of Slocket and its co-founders so as uh, being authors of the white paper, as, write, as uh, being authors of the code, 
uh, for the DAO, um, as um, the uh, administrators of uh, the website, uh, f- online forums, um, basically doing all the marketing, promotion, uh, curation of content, responding to support tickets on forums and things like that. And so they were very actively involved in uh, promoting the um, the DAO uh, as a product at, and as a dis- decentralized VC fund. But they also state that, uh, and I'm quoting here, that Slock had deployed the DAO code on the Ethereum blockchain. Um, however, this this can't really be verified. I mean, of course, it's it's quite possible that Slocket did, in fact, deploy the code. But let's say we live in a world where one, you know, we can't verify that. Um, it, it's my feeling that in the community and in, in, in sort of the blockchain space, there is this assumption that if you don't hit the deploy button on the smart contract, if you don't send that transaction, that you're not responsible for the code. And it would appear by this report that that is it's it's wrong to think that. Can people be protected uh, if the contract is not actually deployed by them? Uh, does that sort of fall to the wayside when all this other activity is being conducted? I don't think so. At least I don't think the SEC would see it that way. The SEC is just, again, getting back to the element of the Howey test. They're trying to see whether the investors, the people putting the money in, are passive in terms of where the expectation of profit. So I think the deployment of the code is certainly a one data point. Uh, but if there are other aspects, like what's cited in the DAO report, of managerial efforts, um, certainly deploying the code is one of them. But I don't think it's, it tells the whole story. Like let's let's imagine that uh, they had written the white paper, but had left it up to the community to write the code and deploy the code, right? Like where where do you think the, the cursor stands there, where the SEC might um, not consider? You know, slock it to be responsible for for this DAO? Well, so it's going to be a collective test or a sort of a test in the aggregate. What were all the efforts that the slock it or its equivalent in, in the next ICO, what were all of their managerial efforts? And uh, I, the, I know we'll probably talk about this a little bit later, but I think that the finer points about where on the spectrum this particular issue lands is not going to be uh, is not going to be the determinant as to whether the SEC brings its next case. It, it will um, it will choose cases that where this particular element falls closer to the line of not involving uh, expectation of profits solely from the efforts of others. Um, but I wouldn't rely on, okay, we only did these things, and so it's a it's not a, a passive investment. If, if that's what someone's relying on to not come under the SEC's jurisdiction, I'd be very cautious about about trying to sort of position it solely based on that kind of a, a thinking. If we if we look at the DAO, right, and if you kind of say, okay, let's let's apply this sort of reasoning to some other examples, you know, for exa- let's let's use the uh, Ethereum example. Do, how do you think this report would fall in the case of Ethereum? Well, I, they could have brought they could have issued a twenty one A report about Ethereum. Um, I think that has uh, many aspects that don't look like a security, and so it, Ethereum wouldn't make an ideal example for this kind of a 21A report. They wanted to pick a relatively legally easy case to make their point. So I, I don't think they're going to bring a case against Ethereum. Mark my words, maybe I'll be wrong, but uh, uh, so we could analyze Ethereum, and I'm not, I'm not familiar enough with how it's structured to apply each of the Howey elements. Um, but I think the fact that the SEC hasn't brought a case yet and chose to bring this 21A report on the DAO and not on Ethereum large, uh, I think that says something. I think they're probably not going to bring one. When I sort of run through the same arguments and try to apply them on Ethereum, right? So, so we have the first two, we have this investment of money, which is the same. Common enterprise, I guess, is the same. Then the reasonable expectation of profit, so that is going to be more ambiguous, right? Because Ethereum wasn't marketed uh, in the same way as Locket and, you know, Ether said Ether is gas and sort of usage. So that one is is less clear. Uh, and then on the forefront, actually, I think uh, Ethereum is going to be uh, clearer that it is derived from a material effort of others. Because you could say, okay, the funds went to a foundation that then, you know, that was kind of managed in some way. And, and especially it was possible to just 
kind of buy Ether, sit back and, and profit. Okay, you could do that too with the DAO. But so I, I think if you look at this argument and, and they did the same thing on Ethereum, I think one, one could do it, of course, too. Although with the big difference that, yeah, the DAO is a dead project and there's nobody's going to stand up and defend it. And that would be much harder with Ethereum, presumably. True. And I, I agree with you that the expectation of profits element would be the difficult one to for the SEC to meet here. I mean, it looks much more like a store of value um, than, a, than an enterprise that you're hoping will one day yield a profit. You're, it's, it's, it's more akin to hope you're buying, buying a currency and hoping that the value of the currency will change in your favor. So I think it's a tougher call for the SEC on that element. So, so let's move on to, uh, to enforcement. Um, so let's say uh, I, uh, I have a great idea for a DAO and, uh, I, I launch an ICO, I sell a token, um, that token is deemed by the SEC to pass the Howey test and is considered to be a security and they decide to enforce, um, uh, and prosecute, and prosecute, uh, myself and my company, uh, for, having sold a security uh, and not registered as a security and, and followed regulation. What would that look like for me as uh, an entrepreneur um, you know, running a company? And perhaps also, uh, to a lesser extent, what would that look like for the in investors? Right. So keep in mind, uh, the two types of cases, very generally speaking, that the SEC brings are fraud cases and non-fraud cases. So in your hypothetical, Brian, of, of uh, a situation where it's a registration violation, that's a non-fraud violation. In other words, a person doesn't have to intend to be defrauding people to violate the law. So the way it would start is some staff attorney in one of the SEC's office would first catch wind of, of your DAO and start investigating. So they get subpoena power. At this point, there's no lawsuit been filed. No allegations have been made. The SEC hasn't reached any conclusions about whether a security exists or not. It's purely an information gathering process. So that staff attorney sends out subpoenas, picks up the phone, starts calling people, would call investors, would call uh, or, or send subpoenas to uh, the principals, the organizers, and gather information. And a threshold issue is going to be, does this enterprise meet the Howey test? Um, assuming there is no uh, suggestion of fraud happening, in other words, suggestion that someone is misusing the proceeds of the offering in a way they didn't say they were going to use them. Um, I think the SEC would be very cautious in bringing an action. But let's say they find a blatant one. It's you've organized your your DAO just like the DAO, and it's, it meets all the elements, and there's no question, and they decide to bring a case to make an example. They would have a discussion with you, and, and, and before filing a lawsuit, they would make the recommendation to the five commissioners in Washington to file a lawsuit, and then they would file a lawsuit. Um, they can do that in federal court. They can do it administratively in front of an SEC administrative law judge. So essentially, when they file a complaint, they're starting a litigation. Now they're making accusations. It's a public process. There's a press release. There would be lots of news stories. Your podcast would cover it. Uh, and, you know, it, so that's a public process. But now they're in front of a judge and the thing, the, the matter gets litigated. Almost everyone, because you're up against the federal government, tries to find a way to settle that litigation. And so if uh, there's a settlement, that means that the judge never decides whether the SEC is correct about its legal arguments. You essentially say, uh, without admitting the SEC's allegations or denying them, uh, we agree to settle. Uh, and the SEC's normal uh, types of sanctions that it imposes are um, an injunction against future violations of the federal securities laws. So presumably not a big issue. Most people don't want to violate the federal securities laws. Um, disgorgement of any uh, ill-gotten gains is the way they would phrase it. So money that you had the benefit of that was a result of the legal violations. In this kind of a case, that could mean if you had the benefit of the money, all of the money raised through the DAO. Um, and then civil penalties of some dollar amount to be determined as, you know, as appropriate under the facts and circumstances. So that would be a typical sort of non-fraud judgment. There would be a federal court order 
imposing those types of things. It would be public, and uh, presumably that would be the end of your DAO enterprise. Okay, that's super interesting. So if you apply this to the DAO example, right, there was no fault there. I think that's nobody really um, argues that. And so there was also no ill-gotten gains because in the end, yeah, they didn't make any money from this thing. So is, is that why they didn't do this? Because, okay, the, the case, it's, it's just not interesting enough. The, the penalty is, will be too low. There would be some kind of fine against uh, maybe the Slocket founders, but that's it. Well, so they, I think the reason they didn't bring it is because the DAO was dead. It's not a functioning enterprise. Um, it's, it's the first time the SEC has spoken definitively on whether a security exists. And so uh, I think they chose this opportunity to send a message rather than bring a case. Um, it may also be a reflection of the change in leadership at the SEC. We have a new SEC chair and uh, he, uh, Jay Clayton, I, I don't know, I wasn't privy to the internal discussions, but it would be consistent with his sort of outlook on markets to send a message first rather than have your opening salvo be an enforcement action in federal court. So I think probably a lot of different factors played into it, but I think those were probably the primary ones. So there was an interesting uh, post in, in CoinDesk recently, just touching on your uh, your description earlier of uh, you know, how uh, an enforcement action would would go would go through uh, by a gentleman of uh, by the name of Jason Samensato of uh, Morvillo LLP, and I'll, I'll link to the show notes uh, where where he describes from his point of view as a, as a, a lawyer defending. Um, companies in violations of securities law, I guess, uh, very similar to, to what you do. Um, he describes, you know, what, what that looks like. And, and as, um, as a company or an enterprise in the crosshairs of the SEC, you know, whether or not you're in violation of securities law, um, okay, I guess not if there's fraud, but whether or not you're in violations of securities law, it's it's not going to look good for you because this the SEC will never admit to having wrongfully accused or wrongfully taken to trial uh, uh, an enterprise. Um, any settlement would involve you having to make some statement admitting guilt, admitting that you did in fact uh, violate securities law. So it, it seems that for anyone getting into this space and thinking of doing an ICO, they run a risk of being targeted by the SEC ending up in the SEC's crosshairs and in, in, in a potentially in a lawsuit or having to settle for admission of guilt um, for having violated securities law. So it, it, to, to me, it, it sort of acts as a pretty good deterrent for anyone that wants to or, or is thinking of doing an ICO. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, a couple of thoughts. So um, first of all, I would never advise someone to structure an ICO that was close to the line of being a security or not, if that if the intent was to avoid the federal securities laws. But a couple of things you said. One, I want to correct one one point, which is um, the requirement in a settlement that a defendant admit the violations of the law. Um, the SEC has, on occasion, required settling defendants to make admissions, but by and large, most SEC settlements involve the defendant not admitting to violations of the federal securities laws. That doesn't help you much reputationally once the SEC has filed a lawsuit in federal court and made this public display alleging that you've violated the federal securities laws. And I think the point, I haven't read the post you referred to, but I think the point being made there was if you settle a case, even if you don't admit the SEC's allegations, what the world sees is the SEC's complaint making those allegations. There's no retraction of those allegations. And there's a federal court order imposing sanctions on you as a result of those allegations. So reputationally, uh, you know, you're right. The SEC would never sort of retract what it said. The only way to get the SEC to acknowledge that its legal opinion is incorrect is to win and get the judge to adopt your legal arguments. And that means taking the case all the way through trial, potentially. So it's a, that's a difficult process. So is, is that why most people settle because they, they don't want to go through this long process? They don't want to spend years fighting this? Uh, yeah, but in the vast majority of cases, yes. I mean, obviously there are cases where uh, the defendant has no good legal or factual arguments to make, and it's in their best interest to settle for that reason. But for many defendants, I mean, it's expensive to litigate against the federal government with its 
infinite resources. Uh, it's a long drawn out process, distracting from your business activities, expensive. Um, so most people settle for, for that reason. The ones who, who can't, uh, you know, afford or don't want or choose not to be involved in litigation for years. So that's the vast majority of defendants. Although I guess that is interesting in, in this example in particular, because a lot of projects that are now raising money through these crypto crowdfunding campaigns are raising large amounts and, and they presumably would have the resources to spend, you know, maybe m many millions of dollars on, you know, fighting something like that. Do you, do you also think that's going to be one factor that they'll try to go after projects that they don't think have the resources to really fight? I don't think that's a big factor in case selection at the SEC. I think the case selection is how strong are the violations? Um, what's the number of potential victims? Um, and I do think the next enforcement case that gets brought will involve not just the issue of whether it's a security, but whether there's fraud involved. And so the focus of that kind of case is much more on the fraud. You know, we said we were going to spend the money on something and we spent it on something else. That's, that's the kind of case that'll get, uh, um, the attention of the SEC. And then of course, they'll sweep in these Howey type arguments and, and say that it was a security and needed to be registered and wasn't. Um, but I think those, the arguments that were the focus of the DAO report will become secondary in any case that involves fraud. And I guess that mostly means that the, or the risk is biggest for projects that raise money and and then people lose money and they they're unhappy and they complain and and that's really when we will see the SEC mostly taking action. Yeah, I mean, think again. Go back to the position of the staff attorney at the SEC in one of the regional offices or even in in the home office in DC, who's thinking about how much energy should I put into this investigation? How much energy should I put into putting together a case? Um, the the cases, the types of fact situations that will get the most attention are ones where disgruntled investors are coming in very upset at, you know, uh, I was told this, I was told X, and what happened was not X. Um, those are the kinds of fact scenarios that are going to get um, um, a staff attorney incentivized to, so you know, go, and, and the institution of the SEC as a whole, incentivized to go after uh, something. Um, now, you, you layer on, so disgruntled investors will probably be the, the source of one of the next cases. Another possible source, though, is the um, the SEC's whistleblower program, uh, which uh, permits the SEC to award a bounty to someone who provides information about securities law violations. So we've seen lots of um, insiders who are coming forward in an effort to get one of those bounties um, providing information. And so particularly here in the, the uh, crypto crowdfunding area where it enforcement may be very difficult. Um, the existence of a whistleblower who comes in and, and shares information that might otherwise be very difficult for the SEC to get, um, that might prompt a staff attorney to go after a case if there's particularly useful or, or damaging information from an insider. So, well, what are the, what are these bounties uh, look like? I mean, if you're, if you run an SEO and you know, you raised you know, 300, 400, Five hundred million dollars, uh, and you know you're offered some, you know, like say, fifty thousand dollar bounty. You, you're not really incentivized to do that. So uh, the bounties that have been awarded have ranged. The, the, the way they're calculated is if the SEC brings a case, and if the SEC obtains a monetary recovery from a defendant, either in the form of penalties or disgorgement, then the whistleblower is entitled to a certain percentage of that um, bounty. That I mean, of, of the monetary. Uh, remedies that are imposed and collected. So in very different contexts, the dollar amounts of some of these bounties have been huge, up, you know, into the tens of millions of dollars. Um, so if you're looking, you know, if you're an insider and you're, you're, you have information suggesting that money is being misused um, in one of these ICOs uh, and there's a hundred million dollars raised and potentially that amount of a judgment to be imposed, um, the bounty could be significant. So I wouldn't be surprised, particularly given the difficult nature of enforcing the securities laws in this context, wouldn't be surprised if, if a, an ICO case comes out of a, a whistleblower seeking a bounty. This episode is brought to you by Shapeshift, the world's leading trustless digital asset exchange. Quickly swap between dozens of 
leading cryptocurrencies including Bitcoin, Ether, Zcash, Gnosis, Monero, Golem, Augur, and so many more. When you go to shapeshift.io, you simply select your currency pair, give them your receiving address, send the coins, and boom. Shapeshift is not your traditional cryptocurrency exchange. You don't need to create an account. You don't need to give them your personal information and they don't hold your coins. So you are never at risk from a hacker or other malicious actor. Shapeshift has competitive rates and is even integrated in some of your favorite wallet apps like Jax. So you can swap your digital assets directly within your wallet just as easily as putting on your slippers. Whenever you see that good looking fox, you know that's where Shapeshift is. So to get started, visit shapeshift.io and start trading. And we'd like to thank Shapeshift for their support of Epicenter. But also the, the kind of implications from what you're saying is that there's there's like literally zero probability, zero chance. Because right now, you know, we are seeing 20, 30 of these ICOs or crowdfunding campaigns a month. And this is just going up and up and up. And so the, the number is exploding. And it sounds like there's zero chance that we will see from the SEC, you know, some kind of blanket, you know, going after everybody. Like that's not going to happen, right? Absolutely. They don't have the resources. Uh, you know, they have to pay attention to the, you know, the rest of what they do on a day-to-day -day basis, investment advisors, publicly traded companies, brokers, auditors, all that other stuff they look at. They have to apply their resources to all of that. In addition to looking at this relatively new relatively small portion of the market compared to the, the rest of the things they look at. So they will be looking to deploy their resources efficiently. And that's why I say, I think the next case they're going to bring will involve fraud because they can't possibly go after all of the uh, purveyors of ICOs. It just, they don't have the resources to do that. Yeah. So, so, Cause I was thinking before, okay, so from an ICC perspective, how, how would you go about this? All right. Well, what are your options? And then I can I can see sort of two two possibilities, right? One is to say we are going after the 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 ones that are really scams, they're really sketchy. There's you know the case is clear, and, and they have done that to some extent, right? They had they went after this thing called Paycoin, which everybody agreed in in the in the crypto space this was a fraud. The guy was uh, some sort of had done previous frauds before. He was doing all kinds of shady stuff, right? So nobody was uh, it was a clear case, and they went after that guy. And um, so, so that's, of course, one thing. And I guess that's also what you are pointing out here. Okay, they will go after fraud. Um, but the thing is, if we, if you are looking at this as a gigantic uh, you know, trend and wave that's becoming very dominant, that is not going to do anything to slow down this trend and movement because people will say, yeah, of course, they should go after those people, but we're, we're not going to do fraud. Uh, and so we're fine. Right. So, and, and the only other option I would see is that they go after the complete other end, right? They say, we go after that project that is, you know, try to do everything right. And they, they were careful in what they said. They tried to structure it so it's not a security. They, you know, they, they didn't like promote it in dubious ways. They didn't misuse their funds. Um, and, and of course, if they went after that, it would, it could really have an impact because they would be people, projects wouldn't feel safe and they wouldn't know how to position themselves in order to, to avoid that danger. Do you, do you think that's a possibility too? Uh, so I do. And so there are different constituencies within the SEC that will be looking at this issue and they'll treat it differently. I, I've been focusing on the hypothetical staff attorney in some office looking to bring an enforcement matter. And that certainly, I think, is probably going on right now. And they will naturally uh, drift toward the cases that involve fraud. Um, there are other constituencies within uh, the SEC that look at this uh, at, from a much more analytical perspective, and they will be looking for a test case. Um, and it won't necessarily be an enforcement case. Um, I think there have been people who, so for example, the Division of Corporation Finance um, uh, will opine, will give an opinion on whether something is a security or not. And so lawyers on behalf of ICOs may write a letter to that division asking for an opinion. Hey, we are structuring one in this way. Will you, the Division of Corporation Finance, give us a no action letter saying that you will not recommend taking action in our specific context? So you've got that sort of avenue of dialogue with the SEC which I think people will take advantage of um, 
more, you know, particularly following this report on uh, the DAO, so that you can get some more feedback from the SEC short of an enforcement action. Um, and and the people analyzing this issue from that point of view will keep their eyes out for another DAO example at the high end that's raising a lot of money uh, that in the opinion of those SEC staff members involves a security, is not registered, doesn't qualify for an exemption from registration, and they will pick and choose, again, based on uh, allocation of resources the questions, pick and choose some cases at the higher end where there's no fraud involved, again, to make an example. So I think we will see um, guidance come out from other divisions of the SEC, not the enforcement division. And I think we'll see some selective cases being brought against entities on a, you know, that, that don't involve fraud, but it will be more selective than the sort of staff attorney looking for the fraud case example that I described. But in, in that example, let's say they they had a case, uh, they had some example like that, and they wanted to say, okay, this uh, isn't fraud, uh, but we still think it's a security, but we're not enforcing anything. What would would that have any practical implications? Let's say they did that about Ethereum. They wrote they wrote this report saying we think Ethereum is a security, and then what? Well, I think if if the if a division decide the division of corporation finance, for example, decided that there was uh, an ICO that involved a security and violated the uh, uh, registration provisions, a non fraud example. Um, they would take that to the enforcement division and encourage the enforcement division to investigate and bring a case. Uh, then at that point, it becomes really a resource allocation issue. Is this example something where the SEC wants to litigate the case? Um, and so they would take into account uh, whether they want to expend the resources to do that, whether this is the best example of a case to bring to send a message to others and, and deter others from violating the same provisions. And then it would be up to the five commissioners, the politically appointed commissioners, whether to approve the case or not. Um, so you're right, merely an internal determination that a particular ICO involves a security, that by itself has no impact on the outside world. It's, it's really when the SEC uh, decides to take action by filing a lawsuit, that's when you have the, the broader impacts. So one area where we have already seen some impact from this SEC report, at least that's, uh, I think, our take where that impact's coming from is that the, the report says uh, exchanges or platforms where those tokens, DAR tokens uh, were tradable, they are also you know, violating, violating securities law. And now we have seen Bitfinex has announced that they will delist some tokens that were basically created through these ICOs. And Shapeshift has also announced that they will use the Howey test themselves, apply it to the tokens that they support trading for, and then delist the ones that they think fail this. Is this something common that the SEC tries to kind of enact its power via, uh, via exchanges or these intermediaries? Yes, absolutely. And I, I would not be surprised to see a case against a platform or, or, or an exchange. Uh, and the reason, if we, again, if we go back to the idea of the SEC trying to allocate its resources in the most effective way possible, uh, the exchanges are a nexus. You can effectively uh, speak about a number of different uh, ICOs at one time by going after an exchange. So it's, it's, a, it's a sort of easier target, if you will, to go after an exchange uh, than it is to go after the, the 12 ICOs that are being exchanged on that platform. So yeah, I think that's uh, that's from a resource allocation perspective and, and uh, other sort of policy reasons, I think an exchange would likely get some uh, attention before you know, an ICO that, that wasn't involving any fraud. The entire premise behind blockchain technologies, or at least one of the ideas, is uh, this idea of permissionless innovation. And we have seen quite a lot of that. We've seen a lot of uh, new types of application come out of this space, um, new uh, types of fun obviously types of funding mechanisms uh, through, through these ICOs. And I think if you ask a lot of people in the community and a lot of you know, people working in the community, entrepreneurs and people that have good intention, uh, this is something that is, is valuable and is desirable and um, creates uh, potentially jobs and, and all this sort of thing. So, you know, given, given the industry and where it's at today and where things are going in the industry, uh, th this sort of feels like uh, 
Well, it, it sort of feels like uh, the SEC is potentially, uh, you know, if it continues to put up reports like this and um, and and pursue enforcement, uh, kill off the blockchain industry potentially, right, or uh, stifle this type of innovation. What are your thoughts on, you know, how the SEC is handling? blockchain technologies and what this type of report means for the future of, uh, of our, of our industry. So I, I agree with you that, that this 21A report, uh, has the potential to chill, uh, ec- positive, helpful, good economic activity. Um, and that would be a shame. Um, but I don't think we should extrapolate too far from the 21A report. I think they chose the DAO because it was a relatively straightforward application that they could send a message. Um, so that's, I think, one, one word of caution is let's not extrapolate too far out. Um, the other thing is we have seen, I think, a movement um, in favor of relaxed capital raising uh, regulation requirements. So we've got the JOBS Act. Uh, the current chair of the SEC has spoken publicly about the dwindling number of IPOs in U.S. markets uh, that he attributes to overregulation. And so uh, I think that um, we'll see some, not reluctance, but some um, cautious, thoughtful approaches from the SEC not to overdo this, not to expand the DAO conclusions uh, too far. One opportunity that I see here, and I think something that might be desirable was, would be to uh, sort of leverage this uh, this this innovation, you know, that we've we've seen with this new type of funding mechanism, to allow uh, what I guess we would call today unaccredited investors to invest in projects up to a certain amount, right? I mean, at the moment, to be an accredited to invest in a, in a company, you have to be an accredited investor, which means you have to have a certain amount of capital or a certain amount of revenue. Um, what what are your thoughts on you know allowing? Uh, smaller investors to take part in you know, large funding projects without you know, this criteria uh, and, and blockchain technologies allow you know, being being the mechanism and sort of the technology and the, the ecosystem through which this could uh, this could occur. So you bring up a good point about accredited investors and obviously uh, the issue of accredited investors is uh, assuming you're dealing with a security. Um, and you're trying to fit that offering of securities into an exemption from registration, that's where the subject of accredited investors comes up. So if you limit your offering to certain types of investors, accredited investors, or if you limit your offering to certain geographies, then you may your offering may qualify for an exemption from the registration provision. So the accredited investor threshold obviously keeps out of these offerings lots of people who don't meet the income and net worth requirements. So there's a whole movement separate and apart from the ICO movement to reform the accredited investor definition to expand the opportunities available to investors who don't meet that threshold. And that certainly that would apply here if that reform takes takes hold. Yeah, I mean, expanding opportunities is, is I guess, where where there's there's a lot of potential. I mean, just look at you know the the Jobs Act and 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 the provisions in there for crowdfunding and and just the entire industry that 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 uh, that blossomed from that. Um, it, it it would I think definitely be a step in the right direction if um, it, you know, similarly with ICOs we we could open up uh, this uh, this this capital to you know just. Um, non-accredited investors or people that just, you know, want to invest, uh, you know, s- small amounts of money in, in these projects. Right, right. So I, I think uh, the accredited investor issue becomes an issue if your ICO is a security and you're trying to fit your ICO into a, a registration exemption. You know, I think we can, if we're looking to see the way the ICO market's going to evolve, I think if we look at the uh, private placement market, which happens right now every day, where people are raising money through private placements of securities, um, I think you'll see some similarities in the ICO markets. I think people will continue, some people will continue to raise money through ICOs and not really pay much attention to the the registration issue, the issue outlined in the DAO report. That's just going to happen. And some of those people will raise money, some of them will do good things, and some of them might get sued by the SEC. But I for all the reasons we've talked about today in terms of resource allocation and uh, the incentive there is to have these ICOs, I think they're going to happen one way or the other. And so uh, the SEC should find ways to 
to enable the market to happen uh, in ways that would protect investors, but not not squelch the, the innovation that's going on here. So the last podcast episode we did was with uh, with Dan Larimer, who's the CTO of EOS. EOS is is the project that has uh, raised like they've like raised three hundred million dollars so far. So I think it's the the biggest ever at this point. And, and they have a very interesting uh, legal structure. So what they in their terms said was the token has no features, no value, no functionalities, no rights, no uh, basically that the uh, people putting in money have no rights uh, whatsoever. Uh, and then the other thing they argued was that um, the money is not actually going towards building the thing, but it's just going to the company. Uh, and they already had the money for building the thing. Uh, and so that is sort of this disassociation, I guess. Uh, I don't know if this was actually uh, clear to people who put in money. I didn't follow it too closely. What do you think of of that kind of argument? Do you think we will see these? I don't know. To me, to me, they feel somewhat bizarre uh, twists of. Uh, and, and is that something that the SEC will then say? Okay, well, it's harder to go after these, so we'll will not do that. I don't think the SEC would ever say that. I, I they won't shy away from a hard case particularly if there's fraud involved. But the way you describe the EOS thing sounds very novel. Frankly, it sounds like a charitable enterprise. I mean, you're you're donating money for what purpose? Uh, it sounds like uh, for any purpose. Except it's, except it's a for-profit, right? So it's actually... Right. Uh, but in terms of the investors' expectations, um, the way you described it makes it sound like the investors should, are being told they should have no expectations of anything uh, profitable coming out of this. Um, so even if it's structured as a for-profit, it sounds like the company is trying to position itself as you know, diminishing any expectations of profits. Right. But of course, this is this is in the terms and conditions sort of hidden away. You know, the, 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 I think the expectation of most people when putting money into this is that there is an expectation of profit, uh, whether or not they read the terms of service. Right. And, and that gets back to sort of what we talked about before about the SEC will look at the economic substance of the arrangement rather than the, the gloss that the promoter puts over it. So if, in fact, people are investing with the expectation of profits, um, uh, you know, the SEC could, could make a case there, particularly if they're raising uh, large amounts of money, if that is the kind of thing that would get the SEC's attention. Maybe one question, just that we haven't really covered, is, but like, what, what, from from your standpoint and where you stand as a securities lawyer, like, what is your impression or about what's happening in the blockchain space right now, and just the uh, the massive amounts of money that are being raised in these very short amount of times for projects that very much are in the seed stage, or not even in the seed stage. I think it's fantastic. I think that the more opportunities there are for investors to uh, engage uh, with investments, particularly uh, investments that involve new technology, I think it's fantastic. It's uh, you know the, I I fear that a couple of bad apples will spoil the bunch. Uh, there will be uh, you know people who who are not honorable, who are misusing the investors' money, and um, when the SEC brings a fraud case against those people, it will give the impression that there's something the you know, problematic with the entire market. I think that's a shame because I think it's a, a a great opportunity yeah absolutely that's a a great uh, great perspective uh, so yeah nick thanks so much for coming on that was super interesting uh, super valuable uh, also personally to just learn so much about the sec how they how they will think about this this stuff how they will go about this i think a lot of people will will find this very very illuminating so thanks so much for joining us today oh, it's my pleasure it's been great talking to you and thanks so much for a listener for once again uh, tuning in. So be a part of Less Stop Bitcoin Network. You can find this show and other shows on lessstopbitcoin.com. If you want to support the show, then please leave us an iTunes review. It helps new people find the show. Thanks so much. We look forward to being back next week.